back for another Q&A in my nice little Christmas sweater here. And the first question comes from Tom, and he asks, what do I think about a sharper increase in volume throughout a mesocycle resulting in a shorter mesocycle compared to slowly increasing volume and having a longer mesocycle? Very good question. This is something that right when I started hearing about the concepts of the volume landmarks, I was like, hey, why wouldn't we work from the landmarks as slowly as possible? So we make sure that our training is still effective our, between our MEV and our MRV, but we maximize how long our mesocycles are, which extends how much time throughout the year that we are training in an overloading fashion, resulting in adaptation. However, I think that it's probably a better idea to try to train each week pretty close to just under your MRV, right around about where you can recover from, just under that, and wherever your mesocycle ends is where it ends, when you can no longer increase volume. So for example, maybe you add two sets per muscle per week, and that kind of lands you in that right under your MRV, maybe somewhere around that MAV, and after four or five weeks of that, you try to add two more sets, your performance goes down, you're feeling beat up, and then you're ready for a deload. I would prefer that approach to just trying to add one set each and every week and each and every week when you might be able to do a little bit more and benefit from it. And my rationale for this is because I think that you might see similar stimulus for muscle growth in a four-week mesocycle of taking that approach of doing about as much as you can each week and scaling with your recovery capacities compared to a six or seven week longer mesocycle. I think that the total stimulus for those might be similar. So if you're telling me that in four weeks you can see a fairly similar stimulus to six or seven weeks in total, well, then I would say the four weeks makes more sense. Now, the argument is that six or seven weeks doing this is going to result in more time training throughout the year. So even if you get a similar stimulus across four weeks, then maybe across the entire year, it's similar. Well, I could definitely see the argument for that as well, and I do think that it probably would be similar. However, I do think that when we start a mesocycle, we're potentially on the clock for kind of adaptive resistance from hypertrophy training. So the more we train for hypertrophy, the more our body potentially... This is very potential, but might downregulate some processes for anabolism. It might limit how much we can grow. It'd be cool if that didn't happen because then we just keep on growing, but that could potentially happen. So the deload might kind of resensitize us a little bit to that hypertrophy stimulus compared to if we did a six-week mesocycle I think that we might actually run into that adaptive resistance at similar time frames as taking sharper jumps in volume. So I think that at say week three or four of a mesocycle, regardless of how fast you try to increase volume, I think that you might have similar, what's the word? similar resultants, similar, you may have a similar looking physiology regarding your adaptive resistance, if that makes sense. Like this stuff's kind of complicated. I don't know if I'm explaining it very well. Like I understand it in my head, but it's still hard to articulate. So what I'm saying is that I think that when you compare a shorter mesocycle of sharper increases compared to a longer mesocycle of less increases, the total stimulus for growth might be similar between the two. Okay? Which would make you say, okay, well then, why won't you do it in four weeks? What? The stimulus might be in six. 
I'd say that too. But then the argument, like I said, is less time deloading. But what I'm saying is that you might actually see less gains in those final couple weeks of a six or seven week muscle cycle because adaptive resistance is potentially still kind of upticking. So you might argue that you would prefer to have a deload after every four or five weeks. Because if that adaptive resistance is going to happen anyways, then might as well deload, dissipate some of that, and start a fresh mesocycle. Does that kind of make sense? Hopefully it does. If not, shoot me a question. Ask me follow-up questions on this topic. I think it's a very interesting one. Hopefully I articulated that somewhat decently. All right? So I appreciate the question, Tom. Next question comes from Cussie and Ness. They're a junior doctor and they have a crazy shifts and they're basically trying to do a three time for week, three time per week, full body training, training at MEV. Is that good for slow and steady progress? I think that by definition, training at MEV is good for slow and steady progress. Probably not your best progress, but MEV is the minimum effective volume to grow at a appreciable rate. So not necessarily grow at all, but at an appreciable rate, significant. So if you're shooting for that lower end there, then yes, I do think that you can use a three time per week full body training split to get slow and steady progress. And if I only had three days to train a week, I would definitely very much likely be doing three full bodies. Now, depending on your goals, it might look quite a bit different. Like for me personally, I would probably prioritize my upper body quite a bit. So mine would probably look a little bit more skewed to where I might only do like lower body compounds on one day of the week and have kind of isolations on the other days and then really hammer the upper body. But I absolutely think that training three days per week, full body, you can definitely hit that MEV territory for a lot of people. Now, an advanced bodybuilder or late intermediate bodybuilder who knows they need quite a bit of volume to progress and they are, like if you took Steve Hall and you gave him a three time per week training program, he might have a hard time hitting his MEV with something like that. But if you're later beginner, early intermediate trainee, I absolutely think you can accomplish that, all right? So hopefully that helps you out there. Now, third question is from just in general from a lot of clients. What I get is, when using reps and reserve, how do I know when to add weight? Well, the answer is very simple. When the weight you're using no longer lands you in your target rep range with your target reps and reserve, that's when you add weight. Simple as that. So if you're using a uh, hundred pounds for dumbbell bench press and your rep range is six to eight and you hit 10 reps on your first set, I would add weight. And let's say you're shooting for two reps in reserve, you hit 10 reps at two reps in reserve, great, add weight. And I wouldn't, I would prioritize your rep range and your reps in reserve over just arbitrarily adding weight. And I would just keep hitting your rep range and your reps in reserve each week and let those strength increases come to you. When you are outside of your rep range and you're still hitting your reps in reserve, great, add weight then. But kind of let that strength increase come to you. Now, that doesn't mean that you're still not trying to get stronger from meso to meso or anything like that. But I wouldn't just arbitrarily add weight to add weight. I would add weight when your performance is telling you that, hey, the weight I'm using no longer lands me in this rep range for this reps and reserve target. All right. Next question comes from an IGDM and they didn't really say they wanted this on the Q&A, so I'm not going to say their name, but they ask like planned versus reactive deloads. What do I think about that? And I think that both can work well, both planned and reactive deloads. And I would say that 
Deloads, I think that planned deloads come in the best when you know you have something going on in life. So you know you have Christmases coming up or you know you have a trip or a vacation. Great. Let's plan for a this long of a mesocycle and deload for this vacation. However, I still think that reactive deloads, I think that deloads should be somewhat reactive in a sense. And what I mean by that is I think that deloads should, there should be at least like some fatigue there to deload. Like I don't think that you should just arbitrarily deload if your performance is going really well, you're crushing it in the gym, you're feeling really good, and you're scaling volume from week to week. I wouldn't just arbitrarily deload if everything's going well. But if you start to notice some signs of, hey, I could use a deload, then yes, let's let's do a deload. And then once you kind of get a good idea of, hey, after four to six weeks of accumulating volume kind of like this, this is when I typically need a deload. Okay, then you can plan a deload kind of loosely every four to six weeks. If you're still feeling really good, you're not seeing indicators of needing a deload, which I'll get to in a sec, then keep going. But if you are seeing those indicators, cut it short, take a deload. Like, I I think that in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to make any difference whether you deload after every fourth week or after every fifth week, you know, like kind of like we talked about earlier. Depending on, I would still accumulate volume about as much as you can each week if you're trying to maximize things, which for my clients, I would say I do this with maybe half. And the reason I don't is because life stuff, life constraints, time constraints. I do not accumulate for most clients for every single body part. But I do think that deloads should be reactive in some sense. And some indicators of maybe needing a deload, decreases in performance and overlapping soreness are my two favorites. So if you're a little bit sore from session to session, or you're noticing your performance is consistently going down from week to week, okay, that's when I like to implement deloads. Those are my two favorite proxies. I think that those, now there's of course some subjectivity in soreness and probably in performance as well because when we're using reps and reserve, there's subjectivity there. But I think that those are more objective than using other indicators like you're starting to notice you're more irritable, your sleep is kind of getting thrown off a little bit, and you're just generally feeling fatigued. I would say that I would like to see at least one of the first two I mentioned, like decreases in performance or some overlapping soreness, to say that training is the cause of some of the other stuff, like more fatigue, some more disrupted sleep and stuff like that. But if you're getting disrupted sleep, you're more irritable throughout the day, you are seeing overlapping soreness and your performance is starting to tank. Okay, now we're good to deload. But that's what I would look at. I I would probably, I like the approach of planning a deload every four to six weeks, but then having it be flexible. To where if things are going great, let's push it back a week. If we're starting to see some of these indicators, okay, let's take the deload. All right, so I hope that helps you out. And the final question was also an Instagram DM, but also not going to say their name because I don't know if they wanted me to have it on, like, if the question was for the Q&A or not. But they asked, they're going through finals, they can't stick to their diet, they're really stressed out, what should they do? For me, the answer is easy. Diet break. I would just bring calories up to maintenance for finals week and not worry about it. And, you know, I I think that people run into issues with this, and myself included, is just not being patient enough with things. Like, if it's finals week, you're having a hard time sticking to your diet, you're really stressed out. What is it going to hurt in the grand scheme of things to chill on the diet for five days during finals week? Five days out of 
If you have to push your diet back five more days, is that really going to impact things a whole lot? No. And if it prevents you from going on and off and on and off your diet during finals week and prevents you from stressing about that and helps you perform better on your tests because having plenty of blood glucose going on in your brain helps with cognition, well, I would say the benefits of doing that far outweigh trying to limp your way through a diet during finals week. All right, so I'll bring things to maintenance, just chill for a few days, and it's probably going to be all right. All right, so that is all I have for questions this week. Drop your questions below, and I'll see you next Sunday for another Q&A.